Welcome to Module 3. In this module, we will be discussing speech sounds and speech sound disorders. Among those speech sound disorders are articulation and phonological disorders, but we will also be discussing other speech sound disorders. Keep in mind that speech is separate from language. Therefore, in this module, you will be able to differentiate between speech and language. You will also be able to classify speech sounds, list developmental milestones of speech development, and explain assessment treatment of articulation, phonological, and other speech sound disorders. Take a look at this picture on slide one. You see many different symbols. Some of these symbols look like letters. However, these are not letters. These are phonemes. Phonemes represent sound. ASHA, the American Speech Language Hearing Association, defines language as a system of symbols that can be spoken, written, or signed and it's used for communication and thought. Speech is defined as a production of various sounds. Your book defines a phoneme as an abstract concept, an internal idealized version of specific speech sounds. So think about a phoneme as a representation of a speech sound that changes meaning. For example, boy becomes toy when the b becomes t. Notice I didn't say b or t. If I did, I would have to add a vowel. I'm just saying these single sounds, b and t. As you can see here, the b and t is in between some slash marks. These slash marks are called virgules. Whenever you see a symbol or phoneme between the slash marks, you know that you are saying the sound or the phoneme. The sound here again is b or t, not b or t. Another word that you should be familiar with is phone. Phone simply means sound. You will see this word in other words such as phoneme also, you'll see it in a word like allophone. Allophone means variations that occur from production to production. So it's the same sound, but there's a little bit of a variation of that sound depending on what word it's in or where it is spoken. For example, if it's spoken in the South, it may sound different than a word that's spoken in Boston or New York. It can be the exact same sound, but it sounds a little bit different based on the dialect. That sound can also sound a little bit different based on the other sounds that surround it. So for example, the p sound in stop can sound very different than the p sound in potato or pop. Again, it's the same sound, there's just a slight variation in the sound. The International Phonetic Alphabet, or the IPA, has a symbol for every human speech sound. English only uses about 40 of the phonemes represented by the IPA. You will not have to learn all 40 of these phonemes for this course. However, as you continue to study speech language pathology or audiology, you will need to learn these phonemes. Speech language pathologists transcribe exactly what is being said by using the IPA when evaluating a child or an adult. The IPA helps us avoid confusion where multiple letter combinations are used to represent sounds being produced. Remember when you are transcribing or writing down the phonemes that are being said, you put them inside virgules or those slash marks that I showed you on the previous slide. 
Take a look here at the International Phonetic Alphabet and see if you can recognize some of these sounds. You will see the consonants at the top and the vowels down below. Speech sounds can be classified into two categories, vowels and consonants. Vowels can further be divided into monothongs and diphthongs. Monothongs are one-sounded vowels and diphthongs have two sounds. So for example, in the word bay, the vowel sound A goes from a mid-front A sound to a high front E sound, A. That's a two-sounded vowel or a diphthong. Vowels are described as by their tongue position and their tongue height. Tongue position means front, central, low, and tongue height is high, mid, or low. Look at the chart at the top of page 45 to further understand vowels. Let's now look at the speech sounds that we call consonants. Consonants are described by their place, manner, and voicing. Let's now take a look at consonants. Consonants are classified according to place, manner, and voicing. Place refers to the location where a sound is made within the vocal tract or the place of articulatory production. There are eight places where sounds can be produced. One place is the bilabial sound. Bilabials refer to two lips, bi meaning two and labial meaning lip. The b, p, w sounds are bilabial sounds. Labiodental refers to the lip and dental sound, so when the lip goes to the teeth. Linguodental refers to the tongue and the teeth, so that's lingua meaning tongue and dental meaning teeth. Lingua alveolar or simply alveolar sounds refers to the tongue and the alveolar ridge. The alveolar ridge, remember, is right behind the top teeth. The lingua palatal sounds refers to the tongue and the palate or the hard palate, the roof of the mouth. Those can be called palatal sounds also. The lingua velar sounds or tongue to the soft palate, tongue to the velum, those can also be called velar sounds. Labiovelar refers to the lips to the soft palate or lips to the velum. And then finally the glottal sounds which is made at the glottis. And the glottis remember is the space between the vocal folds. That sound is the h sound. The next classification for consonants that we'll discuss is voicing. Voicing refers to whether the vocal folds are vibrating or not. Remember when the vocal folds are adducted or come together, they're vibrating and that makes a voiced sound. And when they're open, you can make a voiceless sound. All vowels are voiced, but remember consonants can be voiced or voiceless. The next way we'll discuss classifying consonants is manner of production. Manner means how breath stream is managed within the vocal tract and what method of constriction is used to modify that stream of air. So for example, stops, which are also called plosives, are sounds made by completely blocking off the vocal tract. You build up the air pressure behind a constriction and then exploding the sound. Fricative sounds are made by using our tongue to create a constriction within the vocal tract. 
affricate sounds are a combination of stops and fricatives, such as j and ch. Glide sounds are, they can also be called semi-vowels, are made by gradually changing the shape of the vocal tract. Lateral sounds that are also called liquids are made by having the air travel around the constriction within the vocal tract. Rhotic sounds, they're also called liquid sounds, are produced with the tongue in a variety of positions. The er sound is the only rhotic sound in English. And then finally we have nasal sounds. While most of the consonants are produced in the oral tract, the nasal sounds are produced in the nasal cavity. There are only three nasal sounds, m, mm, n, mm, and ng. I encourage you to look on page 46 and 47 to become familiar with the manner, place, and voicing of consonants. Let's now talk about speech sound development. We will talk about how speech develops in the first year of life. It's important to understand typical or normal speech sound development so that you can recognize abnormal or atypical speech sound development. The first stage of speech sound development happens with newborns. Newborns make sounds that are called vegetative. These sounds are reflexive in nature, like sucking, crying, swallowing, or breathing. They have no meaning and they're not voluntary. They're only in response to internal or external stimuli from, for the infant. It has been demonstrated in research that newborns are capable of discriminating between different sounds. Research conducted shows that infants can turn their head or change their sucking behavior when he hearing different sounds. They may suck faster or slower depending on the sound. At this stage, the infant is responding to the change, but they don't really understand what that change means. At the two to three month level, children begin to make velar like sounds or cooing or gooing in the back of the throat. At the four to six month level those back sounds start to move more forward and children begin expanding or playing with their their voices. So they sound like approximations. They might sound like ya 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 or ah ya ya ba ya 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 ya. So there's a lot more vocal play and a little bit of marginal babbling happening here. At the seven to 10 month level, an important stage of development happens called canonical babbling. During canonical babbling, the, the child may begin to use reduplicated babbling such as ba 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 or da 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 da. It can also be characterized by single consonant babbles such as ba or da. At about the 11 to 12 month stage, children begin using something called variegated babbling. A child in this stage may say a word or, or excuse me, almost a word that sounds like hapa or at or gapa. So they begin to vary their sounds. While the child is combining these sounds, they also start to use more stress and rhythmic patterns and so they're they're sounding a lot more like adult speech. Those meaningless combinations are called jargon. And at about 12 months, you start to hear first true words. Before you hear those first true words, you hear some sound combinations that almost sound like a true word that a child might use over and over again, but it has no referent or meaning. So they might say, Abba, 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 
and it sounds like a word but they're not really meaning anything so that would be called a proto word it's important to understand that in speech sound development these stages do not occur one after the other they definitely cross over each other one is not completed before another begins and there's some variation in the ages at which these stages occur I encourage you to read the article listed in your module 3 instructions it's number 3 under the read it explains these stages a little further there's been a great deal of research conducted to determine when a child might master specific sounds it's important to remember though that sounds are produced in various positions of words for example consonants can occur in the initial medial and final positions of words so when we're looking at the development of speech sounds we have to take into consideration what's the location within the word that the sound is produced this information is important for parents teachers speech language pathologists doctors so that we may know what a child is supposed to be producing at certain ages one study with its results here in front of you and on page 51 was conducted by Sander he summarized earlier studies to show when a sound begins and what age it begins and what age that it's typically mastered so if you look here at the different phonemes listed you will see over at the left where the sound begins at what age the sound should begin and about at what age the sound should be mastered so for example with the p sound it begins at about age two and should be mastered by age three that's the same with the m and n and h and b sounds so you see that those all are kind of your early sounds they start at age two and go to about age three is when they should be mastered at two and a half you see this next group of sounds starts there and then they should be mastered about age four take a moment to become familiar with these sounds you don't have to memorize them but it's important to note that nasal stops and glides appear to be acquired early and fricatives affricates and clusters are acquired later again I'll remind you to read the in the clinic sections in your textbook as they have good examples of speech language pathologists working with children now that we've discussed typical speech sound development let's look at speech sound disorders when speech is disordered it can be classified in three different ways disorders of articulation disorders of phonology and disorders involving physical and developmental differences let's take articulation first normal articulation is defined as a process involving the planning and execution of smooth sequences of highly overlapping gestures of the speech organs so think about moving your articulators to the correct place to produce the correct sounds it involves motor movement so the brain is telling the nerves to communicate with the muscles so that the muscles can form these highly planned and overlapped executed movements phonology goes far beyond physical production it talks about cognitive aspects and perceptual aspects of speech sound production 
it's it involves the rule system that governs how well sounds are combined it's understanding the pattern that is involved in sound development so for example producing certain sounds to make certain words so if there's a disorder of phonology you may be making your front sounds in the back or you may be stopping sounds that should be produced as fricatives we'll talk more about this in a minute The other category for speech sound disorders is physical and developmental differences. This is when there is a structural or developmental problem or motor planning problem that causes speech sounds to be disordered. After a speech language pathologist has assessed a child with a speech sound disorder, they begin to classify the speech sound errors. If a child has one or two misarticulations, SLPs or speech language pathologists use a traditional method of classification. This is what we use for articulation disorders. There are four areas that we may classify these sounds in. Substitutions, omissions, distortions, or additions. A substitution is where a child may sound, put one sound instead of another sound. For example, wabbit for rabbit. An omission is where a child may leave off a sound. For example, puh instead of put. A distortion is a sound that it does not usually occur in the English language. They've distorted a sound such as S, for example, making it a lateral S or a mushy sound. Suffering. <laughs> they may say it out the sides of their mouth. Additions are the least common of misarticulations, and that occurs when a child may add a sound to a word. For example, baloo, and adding the uh in the blue. Remember, when you're classifying disorders of speech sounds, it's an articulation disorder when it's one or two sounds and it falls into one of these categories. As mentioned earlier, phonological development or phonology rever refers to the rules that children use to produce sounds in words. So it's more language based. It refers to their underlying phonemic representation. SLPs must examine children's patterns or their processes so they can see if they're normally developing or abnormally developing. It is normal for children to use phonological processes because it enables child children to communicate and simplify the words that are being produced. However, children should most of the time have the adult form of words by age four. They should have mastered most of the processes by age four. Some of these processes are typical and some are atypical. It's the SLP's job to figure out what's normal and what's not. When a child is using multiple phonological processes, speech intelligibility is greatly reduced. So remember, when a child has multiple speech sound errors, they typically are going to have a phonological disorder. When they only have a few, like one or two, it's usually a disorder of articulation. Let's take a look at some of these phonological processes. Remember, some of them can be typical developing, but after a certain age, they're no longer normal. The first area we'll look at are syllable structure processes. This is when the structure of the syllable is actually changed by the child's production. For example, final consonants are deleted off of syllables. 
Reduplication is often seen in younger children and involves the repeating of a syllable or word. So it changes syllable structure because you're saying wawa instead of water or dada instead of dad. So that can be a normal phonological process. Consonant cluster simplification or cluster reduction is where we may take a cluster sound such as stop and it becomes top. Or we may say instead of saying bread we say bed because children can't say that R sound. The next category that we look at is substitution processes. This is when we move sounds from one place to another or one class to another class. So for example, stopping is when a child should be saying a, a fricative, but they're saying a stop. So backum or dis instead of this. I'm sure you've heard children say that. Fronting is another substitution process where children take sounds that should be produced in the back and they say them in the front. For example, tup instead of cup or dut instead of duck. Gliding of liquids is another substitution process and this is where children may say the yewo instead of yellow or one instead of run. They're gliding that liquid. They can't quite say that liquid sound. So it, when they appear before vowels, they glide them together. That's why we call gliding sometimes semi-vowels. Why we call glides semi-vowels because they almost sound like a vowel sound. Let's now look at speech sound disorders that are associated with developmental or physical dif differences. The first speech sound disorder we'll look at is, is the one associated with cleft lip and palate. During embryological development, the lip and palate are formed during the first trimester of a woman's pregnancy. The development occurs as the lips and palate grow from the sides of the embryo and join at midline. Sometimes these structures fail to develop and a child might be born with an opening in his lip or palate, or as this is called, a cleft lip or cleft palate. So cleft just means opening. Children may exhibit clefts of the lip, hard palate, or soft palate. It can be unilateral on one side, as pictured here on your slide, or it can be bilateral on two sides. And they all have the, ability, the potential to affect the development of, of a child's speech. It can be just the cleft of the soft palate, just the hard and soft palate. It can be the lip, hard and soft palate, or it can be no all the way up through the nose as you see here. For children born with clefts, they usually have what's called a craniofacial team or a cleft palate team. And it includes a plastic surgeon, an otolaryngologist, also known as an ENT or ear, nose, and throat specialist an SLP, an audiologist, a psychologist, a social worker, and a nurse. Children often have to have multiple surgeries to repair the cleft. They may need tubes inserted in their ears to help with pressure and prevent middle ear infections. Sometimes they need counseling sessions or the parents may need counseling. And ultimately there are many discussions required to decide on methods for improving the child's speech. So ways that the speech can be impacted is if a child has had lip surgery to repair a lip cleft, he might require speech to help with producing those bilabial sounds like p and b. Um, when children exhibit clefts of the soft palate, they may not be able to have adequate resonance 
and exhibit some hypernasality. And this is because the soft palate must make contact with the velum in order to produce oral sounds. So it's called velopharyngeal closure. The soft palate or the velum connects with the pharyngeal wall in order for oral sounds to be made. Nasal sounds, however, are made when the velum and the pharyngeal wall are not contacted, so they're open. So the air is routing through the nasal cavity. So if, if velopharyngeal closure is not happening and there's air escaping, it's somewhat open, and air is escaping through there, then sounds are going to sound nasal when they shouldn't. There's no seal. Oftentimes, children are unable to build up pressure within the oral cavity to produce certain sounds, including stops, fricatives, and affricates. They don't have adequate pressure, so they need speech therapy to help them make these sounds. Or they may need to learn compensatory strategies to make sounds despite their living their limited physical ability. Dysarthria is another speech sound disorder that is the result of a physical difference. Dysarthria is usually the result of a neurological problem. There's been damage to the brain somehow, whether it's through traumatic brain injury, or cerebral palsy or through a brain tumor or a stroke. Dysarthria involves weakness so speech may sound slurred or spastic. Cerebral palsy is defined as damage to the developing brain affecting motor areas that are responsible for smooth coordinated movements. So you're going to see weakness in the muscles and it's not going to be smooth movement. Dysarthria affects all systems of speech, including respiration, phonation, and articulation. When an individual speech is dysarthric, the production of the con consonants it's imprecise and sometimes slurred. So remember when you hear dysarthria, think weakness or slurred. You can watch the video here to see an example. The picture here shows a patient who suffers from dysarthria and has weakness in her face and mouth. Apraxia of speech or also called verbal apraxia is defined as a speech programming problem or a motor planning problem and it's associated with brain damage to the frontal lobe if you remember the frontal lobe is where the motor strip is or broke and broca's area so that's where motor would be affected that's where the damage is uh, damage occurs to that motor area in the frontal lobe Apraxia of speech is seen in adults following a stroke and it can occur without any weakness or other language problems. They can just have motor planning problems. Usually adults with verbal apraxia have errors that are inconsistent and may appear on different sounds and different words from sentence to sentence. So it can be very inconsistent in this motor planning. So it shows that the pre precision of movement is off. As word length incre increases, these clients have greater difficulty programming their speech productions. Childhood apraxia of speech is a condition found in children and very similar to the apraxia found in adults, but oftentimes there's no damage noted on MRIs or CT scans. So there's no damage, neurological damage that they can see. So, so we know that something's happening with the neurons firing to the muscles to coordinate the movement, but we're not seeing damage anywhere. 
We just know that there's a motor planning problem. These children often have normal hearing, they have normal receptive language, and their IQs are often normal. A lot of times, children that have childhood apraxia of speech have been assigned to ch as having child as having phonological disorders. So they appear to be a smaller subset of children with severe phonological disorders. So sometimes they can be misdiagnosed. Among the characteristics that are involved in childhood apraxia of speech are severe speech sound difficulties that persist over time. Um, the difficulties in increase as the word complexity increases. The speech is highly unintelligible. They have trouble with sequencing sounds and syllables. They may be very inconsistent with their speech sound errors. You may see errors in vowels. Um, it should also be noted that the progress in therapy is, is really slow usually for children who have motor planning difficulties. There's an example of a child with a practice of speech in the video here in this slide. I encourage you to understand the difference between dysarthria and apraxia. They are both speech sound disorders and they're both neurological, but one has to do with weakness and one has to do with motor planning. Know some of the characteristics of each disorder. The next disorder that is caused by a physical difference is hearing loss. Hearing loss can affect speech in many different ways depending on the severity of the hearing loss. A child, a child or an adult with significant hearing loss often experiences problems associated with voice distinctions so they can't tell if the word is bag like a bag I'm going to take to the store or back like my back is hurt. So they can't tell that when reading lips or they can't see the difference between pit and bit because they're both bilabial. The p and b is, are both bilabial sounds. And they can't hear the difference. Individuals with hearing loss may also experience difficulties with vowel distinctions. They can't tell if something is an e or an i because it looks the same. Speech of those with a hearing loss is quite variable and it is difficult to, to identify any pattern associated with hearing loss. It's different for every individual. In order to determine if a child has a speech sound disorder and needs treatment, the speech language pathologist must complete a series of steps to assess the child's articulation and phonological development. The first step in assessment is performing an articulation and phonological screening. A screening is a brief assessment to determine if the child is developing typically. Children may repeat sentences, describe a picture, or tell a story. During this process, the SLP is noting the number of sound errors and the child's chronological age and expectations for correct sound production when the child is compared to other children of the same age. Upon completion of the screening, the SLP can decide if a child needs further testing or if you can wait a few months and see if the child is just developing normally. Oftentimes, the SLP, the parent, and the teacher will make this determination. After the child's speech has been screened and further assessment is warranted, a speech language pathologist will conduct a hearing screening. Most young children entering kindergarten are required to undergo a screening. It is important 
and always recommended that children's hearing should be screened to rule out any hearing loss or problems with hearing that may affect speech sound development. Speech language pathologists are trained to do hearing screenings, but hearing evaluations fall within the role of the audiologist. Audiologists are trained specialists in the non-medical diagnosis and treatment of hearing disorders. We'll talk more about audiology and hearing evaluations later on in the semester. An audiometer is used to screen hearing and SLPs may operate audiometers. The next step in the assessment process is an oral facial examination. As described earlier, some speech dis sound disorders are associated with structural problems and as a result, a routine part of the speech evaluation is a visual examination of the articulators at rest and during speech and non-speech activities. By examining the teeth and tongue, lips, palate, face, pharyngeal wall, soft palate, the SLP can take note of any structure that is abnormal. During a routine oral facial exam, it would not be unusual for an SLP to note poor oral hygiene, enlarged tonsils, structural deviations of the teeth, or drooling. Sometimes the SLP is the first professional to look in the mouth of a child and to take note of poor dentition or hygiene or a structural abnormality. It's always important to follow universal precautions, wear gloves, and wash hands thoroughly. It's important to note function of the articulators during the oral facial exam. An SLP can note weakness or tone in the face. Notice if the lips are able to purse and retract. Can the child or adult produce a smile or blow up their cheeks, move their tongue from side to side, raise and lower their soft palate. The SLP will make note of any abnormal movement or structure. The next two steps in the assessment, the speech sound inventory and the standardized assessment may go hand in hand. This is where you are trying to determine which sounds the child produces correctly and which sounds they don't. You can take note of which position of words the, the child is able to make the sound. Can the child make the sound with a model or a cue? Can the child make the sound spontaneously by themselves? Can they perform the consonant sounds in the initial, medial, and final? Are there any vowel distortions or vowel errors? There are many commercial, commercially available speech sound inventories or standardized assessments that can be given to determine which sounds a child can say. The next step in the assessment is the conversational speech sample. So this is where the SLP can record through video of course, they've acquired permission from the parent or through audio to determine how the child sounds in connected speech. The child, if they're at reading age, may be asked to read a passage or they may be, a, be asked to discuss a topic. This, the conversational speech sample will be used in conjunction with the information obtained in the speech sound inventory to determine where the child's speech breaks down. The SLP then performs an error pattern analysis. This is where you begin to look at phonological processes to see where there is a breakdown. Do they modify the syllable structure? Are they simplifying productions? Are these patterns normal or are they abnormal? Or if the child only has articulation errors, one or two, 
errors, you may not need to do a pattern analysis. You may have determined that it's just an articulation disorder and not a phonological disorder. Remember, if it's an articulation disorder, we can classify the sounds as omissions, distortions, substitutions, and additions. And then if it's a phonological disorder, we'll classify by what phonological process it is. The next step in assessment is stimulability testing. This is where we determine if the child can actually produce the misarticulated sounds. If I model the sound, can they make it? Or if I tell, give them a cue and tell them how to make the sound, can they make it? We're determining how stimulable they are, how, how much this will, this will help determine how well they might do in therapy if we can show that they are stimulable and are able to correctly produce some of their misarticulated sounds. Stimulability can help us also determine prognosis for we can see if a child is going to make slow progress because they're not very stimulable or they might make a little faster progress because they are stimulable. Next we look at the consistency of the speech sound errors. We want to determine if we need to enroll a child in therapy and we do that by determining the context in which the child is able to produce the sounds that, that they are currently misarticulating. We look at sound productions that influence the misarticulated sounds. When, when and how are the misarticulations occurring? For example, when they're before a vowel or after a vowel or when they're articulated with others with certain sounds, are they more intelligible or less intelligible? We might develop or use an already developed test that shows us the sounds being used in various contexts. That way we can determine if a child might produce sounds better in one context over another. The last step in the assessment process is to synthesize all of the information acquired. We begin to look at all of our results and determine how intelligible a child is, how well someone might understand them, how sti stimulable they are, the number of speech sound errors they may have, the number of phonological processes or the types of phonological processes, what age they are, when, when the phonological processes should have stopped. Intelligibility is a big factor in determining if children require speech therapy or not. If they can't be understood, ages three to eight, most likely they'll need speech therapy. In addition, children who are under three, if they're highly unintelligible, they might need speech therapy as well. After you have adequately assessed a client and determined that a speech sound disorder does exist, you will then decide if treatment is warranted. If you've decided that treatment is warranted, then you must decide what approach you will use to treat the speech sound disorder. We are going to talk about two treatment approaches, a traditional articulation therapy approach, and then we're going to talk about a linguistic phonological based therapy approach. I encourage you to know these approaches so that you can discuss them on your midterm. The traditional articulation therapy approach is used when a child exhibits one or two speech sound errors. Remember, we called that an articulation disorder, so we would use a traditional articulation approach when we're treating an articulation disorder. A traditional approach involves three steps, establishment, generalization, and maintenance. I'm just briefly discussing this approach. You will go into more depth about this approach and other courses in CSD. 
In the establishment stage, specific skills are taught through repeated drill and practice. So for example, if a child is saying thoop instead of soup, as you see on page 65, you must find out how stimulable the child is for producing this sound. You can tell them to close their teeth and put their tongue behind their teeth and blow. You can also use terms such as your teeth are like a cage and your tongue is like a tiger so don't let the tiger out of the cage and say S. The cl clinician can reward the child for the behavior by saying good job or high five or give them a plus or a sticker. The ultimate goal of treatment is to get the child to produce the correct sound during conversational interaction. We often have to start at a sound or syllable level and move to words, initial, medial, final position of words, then go to phrases, sentences, and eventually to conversation. SLPs use a variety of tasks and prompts to help the child produce these sounds in various contexts. Once the child has the sounds established, we'll move to the second component of treatment called generalization. The child is taught here how to expand his ability to produce the sound from one situation to the next or to a variety of words and sentences. The ultimate goal is for the child to use what he has learned in the therapy room outside of the therapy room. Therefore, generalization can start at day one with home program and home exercises so that the child is practicing what he's learning in all environments. The final stage of the traditional articulation approach is maintenance. The reality is that maintenance should begin even before generalization is completed because the clinician is interesting, interested in having the client take the responsibility of correcting his own speech sounds. So he should be aware of when he makes a mistake and know how to maintain correct production. During the maintenance phase, the, children, the child may have a reduced frequency of therapy the SLP may be consulting with the parent or the teacher to make sure the child's maintaining his productions. He may still be completing homework and returning it to the therapy session to report on progress. And ultimately, the clinician will dismiss the client from therapy when the sound has been successfully integrated into the child's conversational speech outside the therapy room. The next treatment approach we're going to discuss is a phonological based therapy approach or linguistic based therapy approach. When children exhibit multiple speech sound errors and it's often very unintelligible or difficult to understand, traditional articulation therapy is going to be inappropriate because you usually work on one sound at a time in traditional articulation therapy and usually children that have multiple sound errors have a phonological disorder and it's not appropriate to work on one sound at a time. So it's important to teach sound contrast to children in a phonological based approach. We might teach voicing differences such as pit versus bit or sound class differences such as so versus toe. Clinicians develop activities that involve perceptual tasks such as identifying the difference between the two words. We sometimes call this minimal pairs. We use a pair of words, two pictures, and we might ha say the word and have the child point to the one that's correct or point to the one that's incorrect. So for example, if a child is using final constant deletion, I might show, show a picture of soap and a picture of a sewing needle and thread and I might say sew and soap. 
which one is soap? And the child points to the picture of soap, but they're saying sew. So then I would hold the picture of sewing up and I would say sew, sew like a needle, like I'm sewing. And the child would say, no, no, sew. And I would say soap. And so to show them the difference and to put that final consonant on the sound, on the end of the word. Another important treatment approach within the phonological based therapy approaches is called the cycles approach. It will be important for you to distinguish between the cycles approach and the traditional approach of therapy. The minimal pairs approach that we just discussed can be used within the cycles approach. Minimal pairs is just a way to target sounds. The cycles therapy approach focuses on the length of time in which the child practices sounds rather than the child reaching a specific performance level. Within this program, a phonological pattern or process will be targeted depending on the type of process being used. It also depends on the frequency with which the child uses the rule or pattern and the child's stimulability for change. That's how you select the processes that you're going to target. Treatment cycles can last anywhere from 5 to 16 weeks depending upon the number of sounds being addressed and the child's ability to make changes. When the cl clinician selects a phonological process that will be addressed, it is recommended that each sound within that class of sounds be addressed for 60 minutes before moving on to the next sound within that same class of sounds. So, for example, if you're working on final consonant deletion, that's one of the processes that you could work on. Remember, final consonant deletion changes the structure of a word. You're leaving, children are leaving off the final consonant of sounds. So to work on this pattern, you may decide you're going to work on some bilabials because they may be the easier sounds to make because they're made at the front of the mouth and there's some of those early developing sounds. So you might work on the p sound as in pop or mop and you may work on the b sound remember in the final position we're talking about final constant deletion so we might want to work on p as in pop and mop and b as in bob or mob but before we can work on the b we must work on the p for 60 minutes before moving on to the next sound within that same class so if you're just treating a child two hours a week, then one hour would be spent on that p sound, and then one hour would be spent on the b sound. If you're only treating a child for two times a week for 30 minutes, then the first week you would just address the p sound, and the second week you would address the b sound. During each session, the clinician will use a variety of activities that include both production tasks and listening tasks. One unique component of this program involves auditory bombardment, and this is where the client is required to listen to word lists containing their targeted sounds. It is recommended that each process be addressed for two to six hours depending upon the number of deficient sounds. So if you're working on final consonant deletion, you may you want to work on it two to six hours depending upon how many deficiencies they have. So if they just had p and b, you might do two hours or three hours or four hours. If they had p, b, m, t, and k, they're all leaving those off at the end of the words, you might want to work on it for six hours. At the conclusion of the cycle, a second pattern may be introduced. So you finish cycle one and then you can introduce a second pattern. For children who are unintelligible, the clinician will work through a cycle of activities, move on to a second cycle of activities, and then continue to address these cycles of activities cycles of activities until the target sounds are evident during the child's spontaneous conversation. So what you're doing, you're cycling through these different phonological processes, but you're not waiting till the child completely has them and 
in every um, word. You're waiting to see if the, if they're emerging in their conversational speech. So you're taking time to play and spend some time um, with the child to see if these sounds or these processes are being corrected in their conversational speech. I want you to take a look at the next slide and I'm going to give you an example of what a typical session may look like using the, the cycles approach. So take a look at this lesson plan and also take a look at figure 3-4 in your book on page 68 so that you can understand what happens in a typical cycles session. First part of the session, the client and clinician review any production words from the previous week's therapy session. The clinician might keep these in a, a little recipe box or a little file box and pull those cards out, or the, the client may have them in a little Ziploc bag that he's brought in from home. <clears throat> Next, the clinician will require the child to listen to 12 words that contain the target sound for that session. This is called auditory bombardment. So the, the client's not producing the words, they're just listening. Some type of amplification is, is suggested. So this increases the child's ability to focus on the words. So you could use um, an FM system, which is where the clinician wears the microphone and the client wears headphones and they can hear you speaking into the microphone. Towards the end of the listening activity, the child can produce one or two words, or two or three words, um, and just hear themselves say the words if you want. Next is the target word cards. And this is where the child will draw, copy, paste, or color about four, five, three, three to five, anywhere around there, of target words for that section for this session. These are going to be your main words for your whole session. The name of the picture is written on the card. So if your target sound for the day is the p sound, then you might have a picture of a mop and pop and top and cap and so on. Next, you take your target words let's say you have five and you you use those for practice the clinician can choose several different activities to address those target words you see here I have one two three four five you can write out your activities here if you're going to play a matching game or if you're going to um, play maybe some kind of bowling game or pin the on a donkey or a mailbox game there are a variety of ways you can introduce these words Next, you do what's called probing or stimulability probing. If you remember what stimulability is, it's the ability to see how well the child can produce a certain sound. So in this portion of the session, the clinician will assess the child's ability to produce, produce another sound associated with that same phonological process. So if you were working on the p sound, then you would move, then you want to move to the b sound next you would start probing with b. So you might say a few words that have the b sound like bob and see if the child can imitate that or mob. You might show some pictures with those b sounds and see if the child is stimulable for that sound. Next, you can do a metaphonological activity, which includes rhyming. You want to go back to your original sound, and you might do something like, which words sound alike? Mop, pop, rat, top. Which one did not sound right? And let them hear the, how the words go together and how they're different. You also could match words that sound the same and sound different. You could write words out, have them scratch out the words that 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 sound different. Remember, you're you're listening and you're using sound, 
So be careful when writing. It's, you want them to see the word, but you also want them to know what it sounds like. Next, you do another listening activity. And this is where the cl clinician, once again, uses auditory bombardment with those original 12 words and has the client listen. To, you can use that amplification again. Remember, this is called auditory bombardment. And finally, you have a home program where the parents are instructed to read that list of 12 words that you have gone over in class. There's, they're instructed to do that every day at home. Read those same 12. So you're, incre you're still continuing that auditory bombardment. And then the parents are also encouraged to use those five picture cards that you've used in therapy that day um, that the child created and practice those words on a daily basis at home. So this is the cycles approach. Remember periodically you would stop somewhere in your session and maybe do some play-based therapy to see if any of these phonological processes have been, are being remediated, if any of the sounds are starting to uh, show up in the child's connected conversational speech. I encourage you to read the two articles that I have in the read section entitled Traditional Articulation Approach and Cycles Approach. They will help you understand these two treatment approaches to therapy. These approaches are also explained in your book.